smartest people, the biggest ideas. Paul's a militant conservationist. He's the action-oriented founder and president of the Sea Shepherd Society, who I first met in 74, 75. Paul, do you remember? 75. 75. That's when I first fell under the spell of those mines in the water, the whales. He was, I believe, still then a member of Greenpeace, mm -hmm. but already, already at odds with some of the other founders of Greenpeace over the question of tactics, uh, including my great pal, the greatly missed Bob Hunter. So before I call Paul up on stage, I'd like you to watch this. I know it's a little chilly here today, but uh, we recently just came back from a place that's a little a little cooler than this, and that's Antarctica. My crew and I just returned from chasing the Japanese whaling fleet along the coast of Antarctica. We chased them for 4,000 miles for 50 days. Piracy was shut down in the Caribbean by Henry Morgan, a pirate. If you want to stop real pirates, you need other pirates to do it. So we're pirates of compassion, but we're hunting down and destroying pirates of profit. Oriental Blue Bird, or should I say the SS Whale Meat, uh, please uh, remove yourself from these waters. You're in violation of international conservation regulations. We're acting in accordance with the United Nations World Charter for Nature and implementing these regulations. You're in a whale sanctuary and you're assisting in illegal activity. Remove yourself from these waters immediately. National laws, we advise you get out of here and stop your pirate whaling operations. Nishan Maru, this is the Farley Mall. We're no protest ship. Now get out of here. Paul? Hello. Well, this gives me an opportunity to clear up a lot of misconceptions about the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Uh, we're not a protest organization. I set Sea Shepherd up as an interventionist organization because we have all of the laws and the rules and the treaties and the regulations to protect our oceans, but we have no economic or political will to enforce those laws. So we've taken it upon ourselves to enforce those laws in the high seas, and we are empowered to do so by, by virtue of the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which allows for non-government organizations and individuals to do so. And so we're a policing organization. And uh, people call us a lot of names. Eco-terrorists. If I was an eco-terrorist, I wouldn't be standing up here in front of you. I'd be in jail. Uh, they wouldn't let me cross the border. And as a Canadian, I wouldn't be allowed to live in the United States. So that's just name-calling put forth by the public relations uh, companies that represent the people that we oppose. And the people we oppose are criminals. Illegal whaling in Antarctica, poachers. And we work with governments. Sometimes we work against governments. Right now, we're working in partnership with the Galapagos National Park. We have been doing so for seven years. We've arrested, confiscate, confiscated, and seized over 60 fish, uh, poaching vessels during that time. And just this last week, we intercepted 18,750 shark fins on the Peruvian border, seized them, burned them, and arrested the people who were, uh, who were, who were uh, poaching them. And so we're a policing organization. And we get out, we come under a lot of, uh, we get, we're, you know, we come under, uh, under a lot of attack, especially by governments, especially by the Canadian government. I'm wearing this shirt today because it was presented to me by, only three days ago, by the women of the Longhouse of, uh, of the Five Nations at the Kahnawake uh, Reservation. And the reason they gave this to me was because they also presented us with two flags, one for the Robert Hunter, one for the Farley Moat, the two of our ships. Why? because Canada took our flags away from us last year. After 12 years of being registered under the Canadian flag, Canada was approached by Japan, and they said, would you take their flags, their registration away? And I received a letter from the Canadian Department of Transport saying my registration had been revoked. Reason given, 
none. So uh, we registered under the British flag and the Belize flag, and Belize lasted 10 days before they pulled the flag. At least they had the decency to tell us why they pulled the flag. Canada did not do so. And then on top of that, they changed my registry last year from, commercial, from a yacht to a commercial vessel. When I came back into a port, they arrested me uh, and charged me with operating a commercial vessel without the proper papers. Although they had changed my status while at sea. But they said if I plead guilty, they'll only fine me $27,000. But I'm pleading not guilty. And they said, well, then we'll fine you $100,000. I said, well, let's work it out in court. But this is what we have to constantly battle our governments, working with some governments, fighting with other governments. But the reason that I do what I do, it all goes back to 1975. And that was when Robert Hunter and I were out in a small inflatable boat confronting Soviet whalers. And we had come up with this idea. We were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time. And we thought all we had to do was put ourselves between the harpoon and the, and the whales. And they, that would save the whales. And then suddenly, Bob and I found ourselves in a little rubber boat in front of a 150-foot steel harpoon vessel bearing down on us at full speed. And in front of us, eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time that harpooner tried to get a shot, I would steer the boat to block his path. And he was getting very frustrated. Then the captain of that vessel came down, screamed into the ear of the harpooner, then turned, smiled, and brought his finger across his throat. And that's when I realized that Gandhi wasn't going to pull us through that day. A few moments later, there was this horrendous explosion. A harpoon flew over her head and slammed into the backside of one of the whales in front of us, a female, and she screamed. It was a very human-like scream. And as she rolled upon her side and a fountain of blood spurted into the air, the largest whale in that pod suddenly struck the water with his tail and disappeared. We had been told by all of the uh, experts on this that that whale would attack us because we were a small boat in the water and we'd seen all the old Yankee woodcuts of uh, enraged sperm whales attacking whalers, and deservedly so. And uh, I can tell you it was a great deal, with a great deal of anxiety that we waited on the surface for 50 tons of very angry animal to come up underneath of us. When suddenly the ocean erupted and I turned in time to see this whale hurl himself, throw himself from the water straight at the harpooner on the Soviet vessel to defend his kind. But he was waited, ready for him and very nonchalantly pulled the trigger and sent a second unattached harpoon at point blank range into his head. It exploded. The whale screamed. He fell back in the water, thrashing in agony on the surface. And as he rolled, I, saw, I caught his eye. He looked straight at me, and he dove. And now I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight at me real fast. And this whale came up and out of the water at an angle over and above us so that the next move would come forward and fall on top of us and crush us. And as I looked up into this eye, an eye the size of my fist, I saw something up there that changed my life forever. That whale suddenly understood what we were trying to do because I could see his muscles ripple and with a great effort pull himself back in mid-charge and I saw his eyes slip beneath the surface and he died. He chose to spare our life and personally I feel indebted to him and I've done everything I can to protect as many of his kind as I possibly can in my life. I don't do what I do for people. I work for whales and sea turtles and fish and seabirds. They are our clients. The other thing that I saw in that eye was pity. Not for himself, but for us. That we could take life so thoughtlessly. We were destroying this incredibly intelligent, socially complex, gentle creature. And what for? The Soviets were making lubricating oil for machinery out of sperm oil. Spermaceti oil especially. And one of the things that they were utilizing the oil for was the manufacture and construction of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said, here we are, destroying this intelligent, beautiful, wonderful creature for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it struck me like a bolt of lightning. We are insane. That's why I don't do what I do for people. I work for whales and sea turtles and fish and seabirds. They are our clients. A few years later, we sank half the Icelandic whaling fleet and destroyed their whale processing plant. It was a $10 million hit on their whaling industry. They never really recovered from it. And uh, a former colleague from Greenpeace came up to me and he said, I just want to let you know that what you did in Iceland was despicable, reprehensible, and criminal. I said, so? <laughs> he said, I think you should know what people in this movement think about what you did. I said, John, I don't care what you think. We didn't sink those whaling ships for you, nor for any other human being on this planet. 
We sunk them for the whales, John. Find me one whale on this planet that disagreed with what we did that day. I will never do it again. That's what we do. We represent our clients who are being exterminated on this planet by human insanity. I just want to correct one thing. Nobody has ever protested, intervened, or confronted aboriginal hunters. None. We are against the commercial seal hunt on the east coast of Canada, which is destroying the seals. The Inuit take 10,000 seals. These guys take 325,000 seals and leave their bodies on the ice to rot. They are the people we are opposed to, and it's the mismanagement and incompetence of the Canadian government that is causing this problem. There would be no bills in Europe to ban seal pelts if it wasn't for the DFO's mismanagement and incompetence. Get rid of this obscenity called the commercial seal hunt, and nobody will stop the Inuit from doing what they've always done. But a few years ago in Iceland, a Canadian Department of Fisheries uh, public relations guy met with the Icelanders and Faroe Islanders and Greenlanders, and he said, look, if we're going to defend commercial whaling and sealing, we've got to be smart about it. Always connect it with an Aboriginal hunt. Always go for public sympathy by enlisting the support of Inuit communities or native communities. If you do that, you will get pub the public on side. The Canadian government is deliberately confusing the issue by linking it to Aboriginal hunting. Nobody is opposed to Aboriginal hunting. It's the commercial hunt that we're against. And we want to talk about cruelty. For 30 years, I've been fighting this hunt. I have seen cruelty out there like you wouldn't believe. And you can read it by Newfoundland sealers who've written books like Mickey Dwyer on Over the Side Mickey. He said in his book, they call us barbarians, and they're right. You have to be a barbarian to do what we do. I seen a sealer walk across the ice with a seal pup screaming over his shoulder, throw it on the ice, kick it in the face, and right beside me is a fisheries officer and a, and a Mountie. And he turned it over and slid it down alive, well, open alive, well, it was still alive, and pulled its kicking body out of the fur. And I said to the fisheries officer, I want that man arrested. And he said, I didn't see anything. And I said, and you never do. And he said, and we never will. And no sealer has been arrested under the cruelty act clauses of the Seal Protection Act. We have been arrested under the Seal Protection Act. Filmmakers have been arrested under the Seal Protection Act, as has journalists. It is illegal in this country to witness, photograph, or film a seal being killed. It's a, a violation of the Seal Protection Act. This year, I was fined $3,000 and banned from the east coast of my own country because I witnessed a seal being killed. This is what we're fighting. The cod fishery, we said that it was going to crash in the 80s. The government did not listen to us. Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans incompetence and mismanagement led to the crash of the cod fishery. Nothing to do with seals. The seals are the scapegoats. You want to see the fish come back and be healthy? More seals not less seals. That might sound a little strange, but when Jacques Cartier first came to this, this land, there were 45 million seals on the east coast of Canada, including the walrus, which is now extinct. And no shortage of fish, incredible abundance of fish. And in addition to the seals, seabirds and marine mammals and pilot whales, it was an inveritable paradise. Read Farley Mowat's book, A Sea of Slaughter, and you'll know what I'm talking about. It is Canadian greed fisheries, industries, and incompetence by the government that destroyed the, the fisheries, not the seals. Harp seals eat fish. They eat fish which prey upon codfish. When you lower harp seal populations, you increase predatory fish populations, causing a further decrease in the cod, for example. You need seals in order, and healthy predators. The same reason we need sharks. We have now eradicated sharks 65% to 90% in all the world's oceans, killing 100 million of them a year for what? Shark fin soup, which has no nutritive value at all. If any of you get a chance to see our film Shark Water, that'll fill you in on what I'm talking about. But every day, hundreds of thousands of sharks are being targeted, tens of thousands are being killed, and we are confiscating on a daily basis long lines and nets there are a million boats out there raping and savaging and exploiting our oceans. And we're simply trying to stop them. That's all we're trying to do. 
And we're doing it by direct intervention. We're doing what the governments will not do. Not one person has ever been killed by a conservation environmental activist, ever. And yet, we're listed above Al-Qaeda on the list of domestic terrorist threats in the United States. We're returning to Antarctica with the Robert Hunter at the end of this year. And we've gotten such a base of support now in Australia that the Labor Party has said that if elected in October that they will send the Navy down to support our efforts to stop the Japanese whalers. We're getting through to people through dramatic intervention. And the other misconception I want to point out, because if you read the internet, you can find out all sorts of things on us. In fact, in the entire 30 years of our operations, we've never caused nor sustained a single injury. In fact, the environmental conservation movement is the best example of a nonviolent movement in the history of the world. Not one person has ever been killed by a conservation environmental activist, ever. And yet, we're listed above Al-Qaeda on the list of domestic terrorist threats in the United States. Because what we are threatening is the status quo. My ships, by the way, are all vegetarian vessels, and I'll tell you why is because, you know, we all talk about inconvenient truths and global greenhouse gas emissions. For every time you eat a 16-ounce steak, a prime rib, that's 1,000 gallons of water, four acres of grain. You know, the resources, the emission of greenhouse gases to produce that one pound is immense. In fact, a vegan riding a Hummer, driving a Hummer, contributes less to greenhouse global gas emissions than a meat eater riding a bicycle. Yeah. That is an inconvenient truth that was not in Al Gore's film. And also seafood. I was raised in a fishing village in New Brunswick, St. Andrews. All my life I've been around fishermen. Lived on, and that's what we ate when we were younger. We were the poor kids who went to school with the lobster sandwiches. Yeah. Tried to trade him for bologna on Wonder Bread, which was exotic. <laughs> what is the largest aquatic predator on the planet right now? The pig. Pigs consume more fish than all the sharks in the world together. Domestic house cats consume more tuna than all the seals in all the world's oceans. That is the kind of world that we have created. We use the seals as scapegoats when we're feeding the, our fish to our cats. The puffins are starving in the North Atlantic because they eat seals, which are now being fished out by the Danes to feed the factory farm chickens. Puffins die so we can produce chickens in Denmark. These are the connections that we're trying to make people aware of and that we're all part of the problem. And therefore, we also can always be all part of the solution. Sea Shepherd's a volunteer organization. I've had over 4,000 people participate as volunteers. Last year, we had 55 people down in Antarctica as volunteers from 14 different nations. And these are people who are empowered to understand that they can go out and make a difference. Each and every one of you can make a difference. In fact, it's the only thing that ever made a difference. The reason that uh, we adapted the Jolly Roger, by the way, is that back in the 17th century, it wasn't the... Uh, it wasn't the British government that shut down piracy in the Caribbean. In fact, Captain Nelson couldn't even get a ship out of Jamaica to do so because of lawsuits brought against him by merchants in Jamaica who were upset they might interfere with their profits from piracy. How was piracy shut down? Henry Morgan. He shut it down. A pirate. If you want to stop pirates, you need pirates to do it. He was made governor of Jamaica after that and then became a real thief. But up until then, <laughs> what we're dealing with is that we do have, as I said before, the laws, the regulations, the treaties, but we don't have that uh, economic and political will to enforce them. We're out there fighting a world war, the war to save this planet from ourselves. And we're only going to survive. In fact, uh, two weeks ago, I was on a right-wing talk show, and they said, did you say that worms were more important than people? I said, yes, I did. How could you say something like that? Because it's true. I live by the laws of ecology. Worms can live on the planet Earth without us. We cannot live on the planet Earth without them. Therefore, they're ecologically more important than we are. <laughs> Germs, insects, worms, these are the important species on this planet, the ones that allow us to enjoy life. As Albert Einstein says, if the honeybee were to disappear from this planet, 
I'll give mankind four more years of life on this planet. And the honeybee is now disappearing off this planet. Pay attention to that, because it might be the honeybee that might be our demise. But each and every one of those species is a rivet in the hull of the biosphere of spaceship Earth. We're going to pop one rivet too many, and the whole hull's going to collapse. We'll have ecological collapse, and we're too dumb to know when that is going to happen. And certainly these biostitutes working for the Canadian government who have been wrong consistently for three decades on everything that they've approached are not going to save the day. The laws of ecology, that's what we must live by. The law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem depends upon diversity within it. The law of interdependence, that those species are interdependent with each other. And the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth to all things. And we are now literally stealing the carrying capacity of all those other species. That's why we're living in what Lu uh, Richard Leakey now describes as the sixth major extinction in global history. We will destroy more species between 1980 and 2045 in that 65-year period of time than we have lost in the last 65 million years. That rate of extinction is unprecedented, and while it's happening, all we're doing is entertaining ourselves. As Leonard Cohen said in his poem, we are locked into our suffering, and our pleasures are the seal. The media is not paying attention to this. You know, people are not aware of it. We are dying. Jacques Cousteau said just before he died, we are killing the oceans in our lifetime. If you have any sense of responsibility, you must stand up and defend them. You have to take it into your own hands and stand up and demonstrate that you have the power to make a difference. And we all have that power to make a difference. And thank you for listening to me. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.